this past February, I opened for a comedian at the Queen Elizabeth Theater, also here in, in Toronto. And right after it, I went back to the green room and I got... And I got really emotional because I was in complete disbelief that the person who had bagged his professors to exempt him from presenting in in class was now willingly doing stand-up comedy in front of a thousand people in a theater. It just seemed so absurdly fulfilling. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. There's more to explore at homedepot.com. From furniture to home decor to bedding, shop online and save 10% with the code UNMISTAKABLE10. Plus, get free delivery on select items $45 or more. Visit homedepot.com for more info. Jose, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you for having me. And just a quick note for the benefit of the listeners, I stutter. Your internet connection is fine. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Well, again, I am absolutely thrilled to have you here. Uh, You know, I was introduced to you by way of our mutual friend, Akira Chan, who has been a steady referral source for incredible people. Uh, But before we get into uh, your personal story, I wanted to start by asking you, where in the world did you grow up and what impact did where you grew up end up having on the choices that you've made with your life and your career? Sure. So I I I grew up in Lebanon, in the Middle East. I was over there until the age of eighteen. I then moved to to Montreal for university, and I. Stayed in Canada since with a with a few brief stints in Manhattan and Mexico City in the middle. Mm-hmm. And you know what impact did you know growing up in the culture there have on you know the choices you've made? Uh, you know, like what parts of you know coming to North America did you find to be shocking? Uh, and you know, growing up, like what kind of advice do, do are Lebanese parents like Indian parents? Do they just tell you go become you know doctors, lawyers, and engineers? <laughs> That's a great question. It definitely can be the case with certain parents. I think it depends if you come from a family with a lot of doctors or engineers, there might be more pressure than if you come from a family with in other industries. In my case, most people in my family were in business, so it it wasn't blasphemous at all for me to end up cho- choosing business and psychology at McGill. In terms of what it was like g- going from that culture to, to North America, I believe I really wanted to move in part due to dealing with a stutter in a society that might scrutinize those that are a bit different a bit more. So 
even though I've always had a big group of friends and relatives that I loved, it was not always easy growing up different, especially in the Middle East. So I think when the opportunity to study abroad was presented, I proactively, I proactively made it happen, and I, I moved, and I'll share one one interesting insight about the move is quite often it's easy to expect that just because we moved to a new environment that our previous challenges were will miraculously vanish i was proved wrong i moved here and the same challenges of stuttering and the resulting severe social anxiety just re- reproduced itself here and that that essentially set it up for what i ended up experiencing in the past 3 years uh, as a journey mm-hmm. so one of the things i wonder is you know in uh, the school system in lebanon in lebanon while you're growing up um what was the the sort of you know stigma from teachers and reactions from teachers like how did they deal with you in school uh you know and and how did you navigate this dynamic as a child you know like what was it like as a child growing up to have to deal with this i i believe it was a confusing experience to some extent because unlike say a uh, a uh, liberal leaning school in the West where diversity and inclusion can be preached and inclusiveness implemented by the educators over there, especially maybe a couple of decades ago when I was in school, if you if you were different it was more of a taboo so to speak and i remember this one time i had to recite uh poetry in class and i had really worked hard on memorizing it to make sure i managed to do a a half uh have decent job in spite of the uh, stuttering. And by the way, my stutter was way worse before I since learned a breathing technique to control it. And I, I recalled, I, I recited the poem. I felt great about it. And then when the teacher was sharing feedback with the students she said oh, she said jose m- maybe you can go a bit faster next time and i'm like <laughs> what <laughs> yeah it, so one thing i i wonder uh you know, when your parents first found out about this, and I know this from, you know, sort of, you know, dealing with Indian parents, because I remember, you know, I was, I, ironically, despite being an author now in fourth grade, I was failing reading. And, wow. you know, Indian parents basically are like kid, fa- you know, failing anything is ridiculous. And I like, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, she, she brought my you know parents over and he, she said, your son is failing reading. Have you considered the possibility that he has a learning disability? And Indian parents don't believe there's, you know, their kids have learning disabilities. They just believe they have shitty 
shitty teachers. And so they're like, no, fuck you. Like my son doesn't have a learning disability. And I wonder, you know, one, do you know what the actual cause of this is? And, and did I, I mean, did you find that, you know, particularly, you know, when you were in Lebanon where you're not accepted for being different, were there people trying to fix this in any way? Um, I'm just curious, like what your experience was there about trying, you know, like overcoming it. Did you work with speech therapists? Like, how did you deal with it there? Sure. I think it's it's interesting that your journey of struggling w- with reading and then becoming a writer, I think, is 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 quite sim is quite similar in some ways to the one that I'll share a bit later. Uh, about how I turned stuttering into something else. But for now, I'll answer this question. My mother did take me to a lot of speech therapists in Lebanon. So since childhood until my, until my, Teenage years, I did go to speech therapists in Lebanon. So this was something that that was actively being worked on. I even went to a, a, psych, a, a psychologist at some point when I was 16, I think, or 17 to maybe to 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 talk about stuttering from a more psych psychological standpoint it's initially stuttering is is based on neurology it's something that that happens in in the brain but of course because it is related to speaking which is a crucial aspect of human behavior and connection and and communication. Obviously, an, an, an issue with speaking will result in, or it can result in social anxiety and feeling isolated and so, and so on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, one, this is just out of morbid curiosity. So, you know, you mentioned that it's a neurological thing. I was curious, like, does it affect any of your other motor skills in any way? Like, are you slow to write? Are you, you know, like when you're reading or anything, or is it just, does it only play out when you speak? It's, it is, it is actually only s- 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 speaking related i i'm sure in certain cases it might coexist with other issues but in my case it 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 has mainly affected speaking mm. Well, let's uh, let's talk about the, the social anxiety component, because I think that the, the interesting thing to me is that there are probably people listening to this who don't have anywhere near the challenges that you do that also feel, you know, some level of social anxiety, particularly now because of, of you know, like the whole COVID situation. Like one of my best friends called me the other day and he's literally walked up to 10,000 people on the streets and talked to them. He's my former business partner, has been a podcast guest. And even he said that it was awkward for him to want to go and start a conversation with somebody because he hadn't for so long. <laughs> um, but what I wonder is you know, early on, how did this impact your ability to, to make friends? And, and, you know, how did you deal with that dynamic? Because kids are, kids are awful to each other. I don't know, you know, what they're like in Lebanon, but, you know, teenagers and, and little kids are actually really mean. And, and I can only imagine, you know, with a stutter, you know, like navigating that dynamic. So how, how in the, like, how did this affect your friendships um, while you were growing up? Uh, absolutely. It's a two-part answer on the one hand i am grateful to have had a a big group of friends my entire life i'm still close with them 
even though we we all live in different countries around the world now the second part though to that answer is whenever it came to talking to people outside of that group of friends i i struggled significantly my go to behavior was avoiding people avoiding speaking and just staying as quiet as possible so that this secret would not come out. I was really controlled by the fear of judgment, of what would they say if they hear me stutter. And quite often it was not in my head. I I did have, I did face negative reactions to my stuttering. So I believe I was trying to protect myself, knowing what could happen if I did put myself out there. Silence and avoiding appeared to be the 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 winning and the safest strategy for me, even though it was safest in the short term and the most dangerous in the long term. With the Home Depot, decorating your home is now easier than ever before. Start by heading to homedepot.com where you can shop for everything for every room. Browse thousands of furniture pieces and decorative accents to fit any style. Explore bedding and bath linens, kitchenware and small appliances, all at the right prices. Whether you're going for a brand new look or a seasonal refresh or simply a few finishing touches, the Home Depot has all of the pieces you need. And the best part? Shop today and you'll get free and flexible delivery with easy returns. Plus, for a limited time, you can save even more on the styles you love when you use the code UNMISTAKABLE10 at checkout. Find exactly what you're looking for and more at homedepot.com slash decor. Valid on select items online only. Free delivery on select items, $45 or more. Visit homedepot.com for more information. So COVID-19 has made all of our lives super complicated. It's changed so much from the way that we live to the way that we work. And there's so much information coming at us every day between news briefings and online articles. And if you have a family like mindful of doctors, even family Zoom chats. So figuring out what you're actually supposed to do in the workplace can be really overwhelming. Well, if you want to get safely back to work during COVID-19, there's an app for that. iAuditor by Safety Culture will help keep your coworkers and customers safe. It's a simple safety checklist and inspection app that anyone can learn within minutes. It allows you to do things like follow CDC guidelines, complete COVID-19 safety inspections, maintain an audit trail, and stay safe. There are hundreds of preloaded checklists available to download for free. iAuditor is the world's largest safety checklist app with more than 600 million checks completed per year. Visit safetyculture.com for your free checklist today. Again, visit safetyculture.com to download your free checklist today. Hmm. Wow. So, you know, the the other thing I wonder is that, you know, like, how do you get to the point of acceptance with, with friends? Like, did it get to a point where you just had to tell them this, um, that, hey, this is, you know, part of the deal in terms of, of hanging out with me? Um, and then, you know, with with those friends, like, you know, like, what are the positives that came out of those friendships? You know, because I'd imagine like, like for somebody to actually, you know, accept you in this way that have to be one, open minded and two, incredibly patient as a person and like basically look past the surface and see who you are, uh, not based on this condition, but who you are as a person. Person. Yeah, you know, I I never thought of it that way before. That that's a very accurate uh, analysis. I I've I've sometimes joked that stuttering is like a f- filter that allows you to weed out the people who who should probably not be in your life because, as you said, it does require certain qualities to to look 
past a super uh, super a superficial detail i would say in terms of my good friends the main way in which it affected things was that i simply was not talkative most of the time and it wasn't until i first i went to the uk to learn this breathing technique to control the stutter that was a big first step both in terms of of learning a technique to have be- better control and also in terms of starting the self acceptance journey self acceptance did not come overnight in fact even after i had gone on that program to learn the technique and such it still took me many years to really accept that i am different and to express myself openly interact with the world e- even though some of the reactions i would get would would be negative ones or ones that might discourage a lot of people from ever wanting to 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 interact again mm. so you know you mentioned that the self acceptance journey didn't happen overnight and i think that you know all of us on some level uh have things that we feel self-conscious about that we think are different about us in some way or another. Uh, I think that that's true whether you're, you know, in your 20s or in your 60s. Um, you know, what do you what do you say to the person who is having trouble, you know, with self-acceptance based on something they believe is different or flawed about themselves? Uh, that's a great question. And in fact, in my TEDx talk, I one of the things I say is everyone has a stutter. It's that thing that that might hold you back, that might prevent you from from fulfilling your 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 true put potential on earth. And one philosophy that I've applied on my own journey there is there's there's two quotes that encapsulate this philosophy quite well first one is is by robert frost and it's the best way out is through and that's a philosophy i've 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 really applied through doing stand-up comedy and other fear fear defying endeavors the second quote is from stoic philosophy and it's the impediment to action advances action the obstacle that once stood in the way becomes the way and i believe that's a great mindset to have for anyone who deals with an insecurity or a fear or a challenge in the in instead of looking at it as as a roadblock we can look at it as a compass that will t- tell us what we need to do on our journey towards self self-actual- actualization and and 
and in growth. Wow. So, so when you get to college in, in the United States, I'd imagine as most kids do, you have given Montreal. some thought to, you know, this whole, I Oh yeah, sorry, Montreal. Um, this whole idea of, you know, what it is that you wanted to be when you grew up. <laughs> and I wonder like what, you know, what are the potential career choices that actually you thought of before you ended up doing what you're doing, which we will get into, but like what career choices did you think were not realistic? What career choices did you think were the ones that you were going to end up in? <laughs> That's a great question. Because my whole life, I, my whole, my whole life had revolved around engineering a lifestyle with as little speaking as possible. In fact, when I was in my second year of university uh, at McGill in Montreal, I went to speak to all of my professors and I, and I asked them to exempt me from all of my presentations. And any class that had a, a, a certain part of the grade, depending on in, in, in class participation, I would ask these professors to give me additional homework in lieu of ever having to speak up in the classroom so i really in my mind i was envisioning a a career based on on either either little or no speaking at all and it might explain why the first industry i got into was was research oriented that that did sound very uh, appealing to someone who did not want to s- speak ever mm, wow uh, so i'd imagine that you know because i remember seeing the tedx talk and you talked about you know meeting this girl at a party and it, the the thought that came to my mind is like what is this like for your your dating life like what is it like when you're um you know attempting to form relationships and, and this just is out of another curious question what is the funniest thing you, you remember from the first social interaction you had with a complete stranger mm. so in in terms of of how it goes w- in 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 the whole dating world, I would say in the past when I was always tr- <clears throat> trying to hide who I am and the fact that I stutter, I would say it. It did not go well because I was afraid of expressing myself. I allowed the stutter to severely affect my self-confidence, which obviously is not ideal for, for, for dating. It wasn't until I really started to accept who I was, embrace the stutter, eh, and even at times make jokes about it, that I was able to to really shift how I interacted both within the 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 dating world and and in general with people as well. In terms of a funny social interaction, so th- there are some that are that were not funny in the moment that we can laugh about now, or there are ones that I 
intentionally would would joke with my listener and it would and it and it would be a funny moment which one would you which which t- type of either one whichever you choose I, I think the one that would be funny in the moment let's let's hear one of those yeah so i i I remember I was at the I was at the gym uh, about a year ago and I and after a, a workout I I started talking to 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 the manager at the gym he he said hello to me and obviously he noticed i i was speaking differently and more specifically that i that i was taking a a deep breath every few words so he interpreted that uh, as being a gym related issue so he said are you okay man you you sound like you're really out of breath. And then I and then I said, yeah, I I I don't know what happened. I was I was doing this exercise and now I'm I'm really struggling and I I even seem to have developed a stutter in the past few minutes. And then he really freaked out. And I said, no, man, I'm, I, I'm joking. That's, that's how I always speak. <laughs> and, and then he, he was like, you bastard. Yeah, it was a very funny moment. <laughs> mm. All right. So I want to talk about the, the, the career choice that you've made, uh, which it, to me is, is beyond fascinating. It, you know, uh, you, you have a stutter. And you basically choose a, a career in which you become uh, a speaker and a comedian. That's like a four foot four person deciding that they want to go to the NBA. <laughs> like, you know, it's like you know, the, of all the things you could possibly do, it's one of those things that you'd be like, wow, anybody else would tell you, OK, that sounds insane. Maybe you should consider something else. So what led you to actually do this? Yeah. So. And by the way, uh, another example besides the NBA one is someone struggling with someone struggling with reading who, who became a writer. So I find, (laughs) (laughs) I would say it's, it, it's not that I always wanted to be, a speaker and a comedian and I was able to do it in spite of stuttering. It's really the other way around. I I was terrified of speaking and thus I I became a speaker and a comedian. One fear defying action at a time. It was not engineered or systematically planned at all. It was me deciding to do one thing I was afraid of. And then that led to another and another. And it kept on evolving from, from, from joining the 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 debating club in my last year of university to then winning uh public speaking competitions uh three years ago which then led to me doing a TEDx talk, and I then spoke at at some 
some events both in Toronto, like the ARC, the, the ARC Angel Summit, and then I I was booked to, to, to do a lot of keynotes about things like overcoming adversity and diversity and inclusion at H HR conferences at at sales or finance conferences and schools and so on and then with the comedy i would say the comedy was a a major tipping point on my journey because it it really taught me to use humor as a mechanism to embrace and address an insecurity and make it public and i think the first time the first time i shared a video of of me doing stand up on facebook it felt like a uh, uh, it felt like a huge step for me as someone who spent his whole life trying to hide his stutter to to just openly and publicly joke about something that for so long held me back was extremely liberating and it did represent i believe the first big step on on the journey i i went on in the past uh, three years Hmm, wow what was it like the first time you ever got out on a stage in front of an audience describe that experience to me the first and the last the last, uh, as in before lockdown, there they 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 all have been t- t- terrifying. The main thing that has changed is my relationship with the fear. In the past, fear would would act as as a stopping agent where as more recently it's turned into a catalyst but if i have to to speak about that first time i did stand up i i was absolutely terrified and right before it was my turn to go up i asked myself what the heck are you doing here and in fact, I've asked myself this question before a lot of performances. So it wasn't just the first time the fear would definitely p- persist. And it definitely, like, b- b- before every massive milestone, I would still get that feeling of the first time. I remember... When I spoke, for example, at the ARC Angel Summit e- event in Toronto, it was in front of almost 3,000 people. And before I got on stage, I remember feeling absolutely terrified. It's a good thing I meditate. And then Another one that is similar is this past February, I opened for a comedian at the Queen Elizabeth Theater, also here in, in Toronto. And right after it, I went back to the green room and I got 
And I got really emotional because I was in complete disbelief that the person who had bagged his professors to exempt him from presenting in in class was now willingly doing stand-up comedy in front of a thousand people in a theater. It just seemed so absurdly fulfilling. Hmm. Wow. So do you feel that same feeling when you're in a situation like the one we're in right now, when you're having a conversation with me, knowing like, you know, like the, the thing is that with a podcast and I was really, I appreciated that you prefaced it for our listeners of saying there's nothing wrong with your internet, but um, <laughs> like, do you, do you encounter that same, you know, sort of fear when you're having a conversation like the one you're having with me, knowing the fact that like, you know, literally it's your voice that is your tool to communicate on a podcast? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I would say, I would say uh, a bit less so for a few reasons. One of which is that I know that this podcast is self improvement oriented, so it's it's aligned with my values and with my journey, and also a big a big aspect of the fear with stuttering comes from people's reactions and that whole aspect. So I would say maybe a podcast conversation while still a challenge for me as someone who stutters, it wouldn't be the same as me doing stand-up comedy or me doing a keynote as far as the adrenaline and the fear uh, are concerned. Mm, wow. Um you know, one thing we didn't really talk very much about uh, is your relationship with your family. Like, I wonder, you know, over the course of your life and as you've come to sort of accept yourself in this way, how has it changed your relationship with your family? It's interesting. I would say I've I've always had close ties with my family be it my my sister who lives in the in the UK or my parents and the rest of the family who who live in Lebanon but also I I also uh, uh, I also have relatives in the states in Europe and in and in Canada, I would say with my immediate f- 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 family, maybe it 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 has allowed me to express myself more and to enjoy, I suppose, conversation. A lot more, but with my with my relatives, though, I would say it has had a, a big impact because, as far as they were concerned, I was always the the super quiet cousin who or nephew who would never speak. So it was just assumed that I was extremely shy and and extremely quiet. So having gone on this journey and having transformed how I view myself and how I interact with the world, this has, of course, transformed my relationship with them for the better it has given it a lot more depth and 
and they've all been super su- su- supportive. For example, my mom's c- cousin and and his wife, who are from New York, they came to see my TEDx talk. They they drove to Ontario to come see it. So it was really great having them there. Yeah. Wow. So um, one final question. So I have two final questions Mm -hmm. for you. Um, You know, a lot of parents are listening to this and, you know, some of them might have kids who have, you know, similar issues or, or, you know, issues that those kids feel an immense amount of insecurity about or, or feel the same way that you did have you know anxiety about uh, what would you say to those parents about talking to their kids about this hmm. it's a it's a tough one i think If, if, so here's how I see this question. If, if I could go back in, in, in time right now and, and share a few messages with my teenage self. I would. Tell him that it's okay to be different. That's a a very big one. I was so obsessed with trying to fit in and just not wanting to accept that, hey, I am different and I will... probably always be different and it's important to embrace and own what makes us unique as opposed to 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 as opposed to shying away from it or to feel embarrassed about it I would also I would also say that that humor can be a, a strong mechanism for for someone to to just bring up what it is that they are insecure about so so that Everyone can just address the elephant in in the room at first, and then people can move on right away. As opposed to that, to that thing turning into an obstacle that prevents effective connections with the world. I know, for example, that when 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 I was a younger guy who had a who stuttered so much pain and shame and and fear would have been resolved had I just started my my social interactions by saying by the way guys I I have a daughter or just or even making a joke about it as i have through my stand-up like hey guys i have a stutter so so really if you had any plans in the next 48 hours cancel them all so such such jokes play or have played in 
in my case, a very key purpose of owning what makes me unique, uh, uh, addressing it right away with confidence in order to move on from that hurdle and focus on on having enjoyable and and mutually beneficial interactions with the world and lastly i would say that one last thing that those parents can can be mindful of is that it's a good thing to encourage the children to do things that are uncomfortable. I know that in my case, even though my mom had mentioned a few times that there was this this kid in the school who 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 had done some th- theater to work on his stutter. Uh, uh, I know that where where I was at that point in life, I was never going to consider it. Uh, but may but maybe had she had. Uh, had she nudged me a bit stronger to do it, who knows? Maybe it would have been it. It would have accelerated my self development journey and saved me from having a lot of 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 negative days. In the future, so really, I would say it is good to own what to own what makes us unique, and to do the things that we are afraid of, even though that they will feel quite uncomfortable. Hmm. Amazing. Uh, well, I have one final question for you, which is how we finish all of our interviews at mm-hmm. the Unmistakable Creative. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? Could you define your perception of of the word unmistakable? Absolutely. Um, I define unmistakable as something that is so unique and distinctive that nobody else could do it other than you. Mm. To me, it seems as though the more self-expression we engage in, the more unmistakable we become just just because we are naturally and statistically unique if we if we convey this this latent this existing uniqueness through extreme self expression we are bound to get closer and closer to the quality of being unmistakable Uh, a lot more so than if we are trying to hide who we are and if we are acting in ways that in more standard or generic ways that we believe will uh, allow us to conform or, or to or to fit in more more efficiently so i would say when we focus on on self ex on extreme self expression even if it means having to fit out instead of fitting in 
I believe we get a lot closer to that on mis on mystic on mystic ability. <laughs> oh, amazing. Um, well, I can see why uh, Akira referred you to us. This has been really, uh, you know, heartwarming and uh, phenomenal. Uh, where can people find out more about you, your work, and uh, everything else that you're up to? First of all, th- thanks again for for having me on. And people can find me on Instagram at yesway jose j o z e or j o z e if you're american i do have a bunch of things on instagram including the trailer of the movie currently be- being made about my journey and with this the same name you you can also find me on other platforms like like linkedin uh, and facebook mhm amazing uh and for everybody listening we will wrap the show with that thank you for listening to this episode of the unmistakable creative podcast while you were listening were there any moments you found fascinating inspiring instructive maybe even heartwarming Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared.